Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com runs down the major markets. New York and Toronto saw record highs. Bitcoin has been staggered, but is it coming back? And natural gas is making a move. Market historian Bob Hoy answers listener questions on the state of the current markets and whether we're going to see a major correction this fall. He also comments on the commodity super cycle, a surge in diamond prices, and rising farmland values. Publisher of VRTrader.com, Mark Leibovit, weighs in on meme stocks, cryptocurrencies, copper, interest rates, and El Salvador becoming the first nation to officially accept Bitcoin. He also has a special offer for our listeners. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese President Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlan, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. You can find him on Twitter at Charts by Ross. Welcome back to This Week in Money. Nice to be back with you, Jim. Ross, did the Toronto Stock Exchange set another record? Yeah, they just seem to be the leaders these days. Uh, TSX didn't even hesitate during the week. It uh, managed to uh, be pretty solid right through Friday. You know, the U.S. markets thrashed around a bit, and then right at the tail end um, put on a little spurt to uh, put them up to new highs as well. But, yeah, this Canadian market, um, it's with... Uh, the price of oil moving the way it is these days, um, that's uh, really been decent for um, the um, the market here. And our, our financials, you know, really came to life, what, 10 days ago. They've been holding up reasonably well. So, um, yeah, things for Canada are pretty good. You know, and, and part of that is probably because our currency started to slide off. So, you know, to maintain the, quote, the value of the uh, items priced in Canadian dollars, they actually have to go up a little bit. So, uh, you know, I guess just to finish off, as far as the equity markets are concerned, um, 21 trading days right now since we got our last oversold reading uh, in the, uh, the TSX or in the S&P 500, uh, we've had... Four minor corrections this year, and it's a uh, 21 days now since the last one. And in the um, uh, presidential cycle, uh, this being the first year uh, post-election, uh, we have been thinking that we would rally through into a July-August period. And uh, at the point we are right now, we would be just ready for one of those minor corrections uh, probably ready to top out within the next week, uh, and uh, look look for you know a minor correction, not a not a major one, but uh, enough of a, a hiccup to uh, put a little scare in people for a little while. So um, you know, um, thinking that uh, the the support will hold in the latter part of uh, June into the early part of July and then maybe another spurt into second half of July into August. Oil hit $70 a barrel. Do you think we're going to hit 100 bucks this year? Oh, well, <laughs> when people start talking about numbers that are well away from current levels, you start to become pretty cautious about that. Um, trend is up. And it should be up right now. We did have that pause at the 12 month or 10 month to 12 month window, uh, coming up from April low of last year. This move, um, from our technicals, um, should have momentum in it at least into July. Might be a pause after that, but at least into July. And ideally, uh, you could push to October, but I think we're taking a, a little bit at a time. 
The uh, the Canadian oils here are just doing famously. Uh, I don't see any reason to be coming up, uh, out of those. Um, in the international basis, uh, you know, we had good capitulations in uh, British Petroleum back in October. You got the nice reversal there, and um, there's still quite a bit of potential as far as that's concerned. We we've got um, a historical on that one that goes back the better part of 30 years. And uh, this rally's got at least another 10 or 15% left in it from what I can see. You know, so in a major, if you're going to have that, uh, you can imagine what uh, some of the juniors and some of these Canadians um, have still got left in them. So um, I don't see any reason to be uh, turning cautious as far as the uh, the oils are concerned right now. Just let them let them run, see how far they want to go. And in the last week, uh, what was interesting is that uh, the commitment of traders' numbers on natural gas, um, we ended up with uh, the specs, the, uh, the non-commercial positions, coming down and getting oversold when we measured them with the relative strength index and came into the lower end of the Bollinger Band. So anytime you get that combination, you will typically get a... Um, uh, a 30 to 40 percent rise in the price of nat gas uh, within the next six to eight weeks. So at this point, we've moved up through three dollars. We're probably looking at something close to four dollars on natural gas on this run. And if the summer starts off hot enough, that could be the catalyst to make that happen. Bitcoin, kind of a rough road lately. Uh, yeah, a big hard hit. Uh, into uh, middle of May there, uh, just interday, I guess, uh, punched down underneath 32,000. That generated one of our capitulation signals, and so you got your initial bounce uh, back to about 38,000, and it has now come back, retested the low, and turned up. So you've got this nice-looking double bottom in here after that rolling top up at the 60 to 65,000 level. And so... The, the pattern that we've got in here with this double bottom, um, I think if you can get through the 36, 37,000, you probably get into the mid 40s. Um, and the style of this whole rolling top and uh, double bottom is something that, uh, you know, is quite familiar. We've seen this one not so much in the Bitcoin before, but if you look at the equity markets as a whole, um, after the crash in 1987 uh, or um, the LTCM problems in October of 98, uh, um, September of uh, 2011, September 2015, all had similar breaks in terms of the Dow and S&P, double bottom the same way we're seeing in the Bitcoin, and then we're capable of just stair-stepping higher after that. Um, there's a couple of other instances of that pattern that – broke out, did the equivalent of what would now be a forty-three to 44000 on Bitcoin, and then failed from that and went down to make a lower low and a bottom. So from right now, there's probably a, you know, a decent uh, short-term trade if, it's, if it breaks out of this minor low. Um, so you've probably got a, what would that be, uh, uh, a 15% run maybe if it breaks out as a minimum target. And um, if it holds the corrections, you stay with it. Uh, if it fails, bail and look for something lower, probably into the mid twenties. I'm not going to second guess, you know, whether it can go or not. Uh, we just uh, take each move as it uh, progresses. Ross, thank you so much for the update. Good to be with you, Jim. We've been speaking with Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com. You can find him on Twitter at ChartsByRoss. Coming up, Bob Hoy, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444.
This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, Jim, it's good to be with you, and it has been a fascinating period in the financial markets. And Bob loves to answer listener questions on his regular segment on HowStreet.com. So why not do it for This Week in Money as well, Bob? Our first one comes from Caden in Mississauga, Ontario, who was thrilled to hear his name, by the way, on our last broadcast. His question for Bob, doing his own technical analysis for the last 10 years, he's found that the boom and bust cycle seems to follow about a 10-year cycle, the dot-com bust Back in 2000, 2001, the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, and now the 2020 pandemic crash. Bob, do you have any idea why these cycles seem to go about every 10 years? Well, uh, maybe it takes that much to forget about your mistakes of 10 years ago at the top. But, yeah, I think I've seen a number where often a bull market can run for eight or nine years. But what I've found in patterns is that uh, going back for 300 years, you can have a huge global speculation and commodities crash. Then out of the ashes comes the uh, speculation in stocks and bonds, financial assets. And uh, that can peak about a decade after the boom in commodities. A classic example, September 1929, which was uh, the previous boom in commodities was blew out in 1920. So anyways, here we are. Uh, The last big boom in commodities was 2011, and a decade later, what have we got? So if you use this decade model, which you're looking at as well, one would expect that this year would see a huge speculative boom, and it's been absolutely crazy. And this then is culminate, sorry, culminating action in perhaps the right year. We're watching it very closely. Good question. Our second question is from Michael. Hello, Jim and Bob. My market vision is usually blurry, but even for me, it looks like the NASDAQ is forming a right shoulder. Likewise, I see the S&P and Dow is having huge bear flags extending from their May 7th highs. Bitcoin peaked on April 16th. The Dow and S&P topped about a month later. Gold seems to be forming a rounded top. Bob, are we now entering the, quote, twilight zone? It sure feels that way to me. Yeah, Michael, good observations. The uh, We just in January noted that uh, the growth rate in the New York Stock Exchange margin debt number can get interesting. And when it reaches a certain percentage gain, which was reached in November, you can count out for a potential market high about six months later, which counts out to May. So, uh, yeah, we've had some really good up stuff. Now, the other one is that most of the great financial bubbles as they occur, oh, sorry, all of the great financial bubbles as they occurred in London peaked in May or June of the bubble year and then did it around the summer and crashed in the fall. So there is, and then you got the old saying, uh, sell in May and go away. So, yeah, uh, it's up at about the right time. You are getting huge stimulation by government, both Fed, well, the, the Fed has been crazy. And so we have a wonderful bubble at about the right time, and the, <laughs> and the threat will be discovered if there is one after August sometime. So thus, we had sunshine into mid-year, then August, perhaps, twilight and then after august duty duty do the twilight zone it looks to be on track thanks for your question michael Uh, another question this week on fox business president trump said bitcoin just seems like a scam your thoughts bob uh i don't know how dishonest it is but when you have a mania going on it provides an opportunity for scam artists so and usually it doesn't come out until, what's the old saying? Uh, as the tide goes out, you can see some nasty stuff in the harbor bottom. But I just recently did a piece on Bitcoin, and it's not a stock. It's, it's sort of a currency. It's not a commodity. 
but then proxies for it are trading on the stock market. So you, ha- you so like a stock market, but it it doesn't do anything. But it takes huge costs to mine these bitcoins. It's huge. Like I saw a number from Harvard Business Review that the annual amount of electricity to keep <laughs> to create cryptos. It could service a country the size of Sweden. You know what I mean? It's big, big money. So then if you look back on bucket shops, which I think uh, ran until 1920, but a bucket shop was a ground floor operation and with a customer room and chairs and a chalkboard for the quotes. And people would place their bets, so to speak, on a stock going up or down. But the, it, it was never transacted um, it, at the New York Stock Exchange through a broker. They were just trading these uh, proxies for stocks. And you had the cost there, uh, you know, uh, office space and board markers and stuff like that. And then you go way back at Stock Exchange in late 1600s in London. Sorry, yeah, late 1600s in London, they were at coffee shops. Like, they didn't have a building that was... A, a stock exchange. They were hanging out at a coffee shop. And then in the 17, late 1700s in New York City, they traded uh, uh, under the buttonwood tree outdoors. So, and then I remember reading about in the 1873 financial mania, some guys rented a room to trade uh, what we would now call junk bonds. And uh, then also, oh, 1861, when uh, President Lincoln went off the gold standard, traders immediately rented space uh, to trade gold in. And then when those, when those speculations were over, they shut the down because they couldn't handle the expense. So that on any boom, of course, more brokers, more customers, more business being done. So the cost of business goes up. But it, veterans in the business know that when the <laughs> When the bull market's over, you got to tend to the costs. And here's the thing. Bitcoin, cryptos, don't do anything. You don't, even, even say a, a gambling, uh, at the Grand Mart, Ma, Monte Carlo. You, uh, you know, dinner jackets, uh, beautiful, gorgeous, and this. Very high cost. But then it's run like a business, so they keep their cost controls and hope that the good times run. But the point on the Bitcoin and crypto stuff is that it's immense costs to create what is nothing more than a chalk mark on a, on a, on a trading board. So then when this thing is no longer going up and it's had some cracks and seriously goes down, then all of a sudden the people involved are going to become very concerned about the costs of these things, the electrical costs. And it could be accompanied by equal amounts of chagrin. So, yeah, uh, there will be scams in this, but I think it is uh, a delusion. Uh, the the folks are trading the magic of technology, uh, great appeal and everything else, and it's going to be fascinating to watch it unwind. And if people think Bitcoin is untraceable, uh, the FBI recovered most of the money taken in the colonial pipeline ransomware scam i think they paid yeah they they paid about five million in bitcoin yeah i remember that but the bitcoin that was recovered was worth two million dollars less than what was paid out yeah so that's the problem with bitcoin right now i guess all the cryptocurrencies there's it changes value as quickly as you can blink Our Mm -hmm. last question from a listener comes all the way from berkeley california justin tells us recent Wall Street Journal article mentions that banks are choking on cash and liquidity and the Fed has to suck it back called the reverse repo. Banks are also sick and tired of holding cash for customers, tell, telling them to put it to good use in capital expenditures or there will be fees. My wife's nonprofit was told by the bank they will be charged to hold the cash in the account isn't this basically a negative interest rate, and is the Fed trying to force this cash out into the economy to create inflation? And the idea that nonprofits and charities aren't really loved by the banks. I remember doing a story back in the 2010s about the Royal Bank telling charities, take your money elsewhere because we don't want to deal with it anymore. So, yeah. Justin, this isn't just a phenomena. 
in Berkeley. Uh, yeah. Bob, so the banks are telling us your cash ain't nothing but trash? Unfortunately, it is, and it's all due to a theory uh, by interventionist central banks that if they expand credit, that will force a business expansion, and that is getting correlation and causation confused and is really the equivalent that, hey, when the sun rises, the roosters crow, and we know that the roosters crowing causes the sun to rise. But the problem is that that theory about putting credit into the market to get GDP growth doesn't work. If the folks are in the mood to speculate in financial assets, they will speculate in financial assets, which they've been doing now for a long time. And, of course, financial assets means bonds and stocks. And in Germany, you've got the absurdity of their 10-year note actually getting down to almost one, minus 1% one nominal. And then, as as uh, Justin points out, a bank deposits. Uh, so it's all due to the central banks pushing a theory that has never worked. But... Uh, I expect the financial markets, uh, in having become exceptionally speculative, uh, they always fail when they become exceptionally fa- speculative, and then that's going to shut it all down. I think uh, great bull markets have always been followed by severe bear markets, and we're going to watch and see. Uh, I think the folks, ordinary folks like you and me, are going to look at the Fed and realize how much of their taxpayers' money they've put at risk in pushing a hopeless theory. And I think the uh, the Federal Reserve is, will come under severe and crit- criticism as, this, uh, as we go into the next post-bubble contraction. So very timely question. And uh, you're right, Justin, that, that f- the banks rejecting deposit-type money is really approaching a negative interest rate, and it's all due to the pathetic imposition of a theory that has never worked. Bob, the Canadian banks, uh, after recording record profits, have just boosted their fees again. What's their justification? Greed. Ah, well, that makes you a banker, doesn't it? Yep. Uh, Can't live with them, can't live without them. Yep. Now, Bob, you noticed some headlines for today's show. There's a huge boom in copper. How clean energy is driving a commodity super cycle. And uh, I noted it takes, on average, 300 pounds or 136 kilos of copper to make an electric car. That's a lot of metal. Yeah, I remember I got my start in uh, an advisory business in... 1976 by taking the historical work on metals to two major mining companies in Vancouver. Placer was one and Cominco was the other. Placer was gold and base metals and Cominco was essentially base metals. So anyways, they, I, I pointed out to them that, uh, you had to look at the credit markets uh, to determine where metal prices were likely to go rather than looking at supply demand. But one of the things that uh, one astute guy I worked with at Placer was very good at with is that he said, Bob, no matter what happens, there will always be a new use for copper. And he's been right. But then no, I would counter to no matter what happens, there will always be a cyclical market for copper prices and base metal prices in general. So, And the... Uh, the commodity bulls have not been able to figure this out. You had the last Two terrific highs for commodities, 2008, when crude went to $147, and then 2011, when there was gold and silver mania and metal prices were high. So, the, um, and then you have the hard crash, and then out of it, you get the decade of party time in financial assets, stocks and bonds. So the, when you get a stock like the Bitcoin, for example, itself, from, I don't know what, $3 to $60,000, uh, the percent gains is likely without precedent, particularly for a stock that, well, a stock, yeah, it is a stock, 
that grew to such an outstanding market cap. So they, these are extraordinary events, and it shows that the inflation is in financial assets, and history for the last 300 sh- years shows that when you have crazy inflation in financial assets, it eventually crashes. And when it crashes, you're followed by deflation in most things. And I'm, I'm sta- we're staying with this. I, I, it is inflation and primary inflation with that financial assets accompanied by a strong business cycle that had bid, uh, that bid up uh, commodities. So what you have, like, for example, the July contract for lumber got up to $1,700 uh, a few weeks ago. And I just looked at the court a little while ago, and it's a $1,050. A huge break in commodity prices. Copper is sold off a little. Um, so I think that after August, many of these metal prices will be heading, heading down. Now, and- there was another headline that said uh, the Roaring Twenties. Homeowners are $2 trillion richer. Well, are they sucking that money out of their home uh, using home equity loans to spend that $2 trillion? I don't know, Jim, but that was a $2 trillion gain over the year from the, pan- the, the COVID pandemic, a panic, and it was just a fabulous headline. $2 trillion, a lot of money. Now, whether people are lending against, borrowing against it, uh, but I think there's, you know, I can't say, but it, it's a head, it's a party time headline. Buying frenzy drives price surge in the hidden world of diamonds. Yeah. Oh, Jim, I gotta tell you that the diamond market is, uh, it's a cartel run by De Beers. And because the production of diamonds, particularly over the last 20 years with uh, people outside of uh, the inside people learning the geology of diamond deposits. So you're fine, you know, well, in Canada, you had a few uh, new mines. So it's been a controlling game. And I looked it up the other day, and there was a fair setback in the index of diamond prices with the 2008 uh, hit to the financial markets. And then I remember reading years ago that in the early 1930s, of course, in that horrendous deflation, that the uh, diamond cartel lost control of the market and there was a serious price uh, break in them. So, and uh, I'm actually going to do a piece on it because I found a place that has some charts on diamonds. So we can look at that in the next little while. But again, it shows that... uh Every a whole lot of things are bid up. It, it is a, a a bubble in everything, and uh, but the main thing is that it's uh, the it is the financial bubble, and when it cracks, uh, I think they'll go into a post bubble deflation, and uh, which uh, will be uh, a problem. If banquet halls did survive the COVID shutdown, they're going to have a booming business. I've heard from wedding planners who say. Not only is the rest of this year booked for people who are vaccinated and all their relatives and friends, but they're booking now into 2023. Isn't that something? Yeah, well, it was such an extra... Now, this was the strange thing, Jim. The authoritarian governments around the world used the COVID um, panic to shut down and create tremendous unemployment. But the power of the decade-long boom was such that even with this terrible intrusion into the marketplace the boom uh well it kind of faltered a bit and then now it's really hooked up and now you got the people talking about yeah everything's going back to normal it'll boom even further the fed is crazy we're going to get inflation and everything else but listen in the last few weeks lumber's gone from seventeen hundred dollars down to almost a g-boy so uh yeah we'll see what happens but uh it is jim it is both a privilege and a fascination to be aware and watching as this kind of wild market activity uh, works its way out. I mean, this is this is historically record stuff we are watching here, and yet recent investors to the party, and some have, in a shorter of time have learned how to make money, and having stocks go straight up is now considered normal. And, uh, hey, as the saying goes, trees don't grow to the sky. But there are many people who have 
suddenly uh, learned how to make money in the financial markets, and their assumption is that the the game won't change, and they will continue to be able to make money trading. And, uh, and we'll gain. We'll watch and see what happens. A headline that caught your eye: farmland values surge, and we've seen food prices skyrocket over the past year. Yeah, well, you've had a terrific recovery in the last year in uh, agricultural prices. The the headline that I liked is because years ago in a library I found a chart of farmland values in England following the 1873 bubble, which was one of those great financial manias, not quite as wild or crazy as the one we're having now, uh, but nonetheless it was a once in every other generation financial mania. And so somebody, some scholar had put together a price index for farmland in England, and I, I'll, I'll drag it out because I should write an article on it, but for 20 years it went down virtually every year from 1873 to 1895. And that contraction in England, uh, in economists, I think it was in, the, the boom ended in 1883, and then a decade later, senior economists in England began to call it, quote, the Great Depression. And it ran until bottoming in 1895. And that was specifically the chart on farmland values, 1873 to 1895, and and a decline for 20 years with very little in the way of a rally in between. So that was one of your basic post-bubble deflations. And uh, possibly uh, something similar could happen. You can never get exactly when it's going to start or how severe it'll be, but all the symptoms are there for a great have a great financial mania, and uh, we'll watch what happens over the next few months. Bob, if there is a huge stock market crash or even a crash in the commodities, is there anything as a, a safe haven to go to? Oh, yeah, good question, Jim. One should always have some gold in the portfolio, kind of like insurance. And then if the country gets bad enough that you have to leave, you can always get a bit to bribe the border guards with to get out. <laughs> I'm being facetious. Now, a play, if you go to cash, there's no return. If you go to T-bills, they'll go to zero. So that's effectively no return. If you're in long bond prices, the price can come down terrifically. So the best thing is to get about... Oh, maybe about a four-year good corporate bond because you'll get somewhat better return than than buying a four-year government of Canada or, or U.S. Treasury bond. And uh, but if you buy some U.S. Uh, good-grade corporate bonds, as I say, about a four-year term, you'll be protect. It'll be a reasonably safe pr- price uh, place on price. Uh, more than likely, the uh, the interest rates will continue. And that and the other thing is that from Canada to the U.S., you're going to get a, a bonus out of the U.S. dollar going up. And uh, so it, you have to find a broker that will work with you to try and, and get this. But if you want to do per, perhaps the most practical thing would be a four-year U.S. good-grade corporate bond. It, it may sound boring, but, hey, you'll get a decent return and with some safety. Bob, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Enjoyed it, Jim, and look forward to another time. Bob loves to answer your questions, so you can send questions for Bob to info at housestreet.com. Coming up, Mark Leibovit, next on This Week in Money. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. He usually speaks to us from Arizona, but you're still on the U.S. East Coast, aren't you? Yeah, and I, I stayed here intentionally, uh, Jim, because I heard there was a uh, solar eclipse coming. What do you think about that one? Well, <laughs> it would be very unlike you not to stick around for an eclipse. How was it? It wasn't very impressive. Um 
you saw it for the first. It was first of all, it wasn't a total eclipse. It was an annual an, annular eclipse, as they call it. So it was only a partial. And um, as the sun was rising, you know, you, you saw a little bit of the, you know, good part of the sun cu- cut off. But then the clouds interfered, and it went into a cloud. So they really, you know, it it really lost a lot of its momentum. But you did catch it for about the first five. Ten minutes around five thirty Eastern time, and then that was about it. But I did get up early for it, and uh, you know me, I'm always looking for geocosmic or extraterrestrial type events, and uh, you know you never know whether a uh, eclipse has any effect on us on Earth or it's just a nice, pretty picture in the sky. I feel it always movements of planets and so forth all have effects on us in one way or another, but. Uh, in this event, it was just an interesting experience. Just by coincidence, I was here. Did you see any effect on the markets so that you could tell? You know, it seems like the uh, summer rally seems to be starting uh, here. And, uh, you know, generally you have a lot of choppiness between now and the fall. And, you know, the market seemed to be, you know, surprisingly exuberant. You had the uh, CPI figures come out uh, today, and they were sort of neutral. And, you know, there was all, but it was holding their breath, you know, that they're going to be some extreme number, you know, greater than 0.5% or less than 0.5% came in, I think, just around that number, and that was supposed to guide us whether the Fed was going to do anything or not. And there's so much nonsense with the Fed and with Janet Yellen is saying at the Treasury, and she has no really influence or right to influence the Fed in any way, and there's all this uh, jibber-jabber conversation going back and forth. So uh, it seems like, you know, the Fed wants to hold where they are. The market likes it, and, uh, you know, you know, our stocks have been beaten down, too. You know, I mean, for example, um, we went along some of the solar stocks today on the trade. I mean, they went to, they were one of our favorites, as you probably recall from previous interviews for the last couple of years. And uh, they had a big run-up, uh, topped out uh, just a few months back, and uh, now they came way down, and now it looks like they may be starting up again. So, um, you know, just went through a big correction. And we see this in a lot of stocks, you know. Cannabis stocks had a big correction, shook everyone out, and they start another run. So we'll see whether the solars are off to the races any big way or just a technical bounce. But just a lot of interesting stuff going on. And, um, you know, we saw the meme stocks like uh, GameStop for GME uh, and um, AMC, um, AMC Theaters, for example, get hit the last uh, couple trading days. And there's a lot of action about those you know, stocks have supposedly, well, they do have large short interests. And there's a little discussion about what the short interest is and how you measure it and if there's a cover-up there or not. But uh, they've been under pressure the last couple of days. Uh, and uh, They're probably setting up for another run as well. So just a lot of uh, action here. Uh, I'm more of a bear looking into the end of the year, but I'm a pragmatist too, as we always joke. You know, you can make a forecast, but as a weatherman does, but you want to look out the window just before you do anything because, you know, sometimes the short-term things pop up and you want to act accordingly. So at the moment, um, you know, I'm, I'm cautious overall, but I'm not going to fight the tape. And if there's a trade like in the solar stocks or a cannabis play like um, uh, CGC or Tilray, which we traded in the last couple of days, big Canadian cannabis names, we're certainly going to do it. With uh, solar getting attention, did that affect silver, which is used in solar panels? Uh, it upticked a little bit. Uh, silver is not running away here. This was uh, many of the traders were counting on a big, big squeeze in silver. You know, apparently the deliveries are not as easy to obtain, and the claim is there's still a lot of shorts out there in the silver market, and we're going to see a huge move, like we saw in the uh, in the uh, main, main stocks the GME, um, AMC type names that we've talked about, Sundial, the Vancouver name in the cannabis space, but it hasn't happened. Um, they could, you know, seasonally we're in this period where the metal should theoretically be moving up and uh, they're not taking off any big way, but they're, they're sort of creeping up. So let's see, uh, let's see what happens. You know, so much attention has been diverted by the short interest stocks, by cryptos, you know, all the coins that are being traded up and down. Um, the gold and silver sort of lost their speculative luster, you know, for volatility that we saw, sort of have been accustomed to. There's been just the diversion of trader interest into so many other areas. 
But um, to answer your question, you know, silver should be part and parcel to the uh, solar thing. I think First Solar came out with a story today that they're building or about to build or finance some huge plant in Ohio. Uh, so obviously they feel uh, that uh, the business is going to be expanding, and, you know, rightfully so. I mean, uh, there is a lot of demand for it. The question is, is that we've always questioned is whether, you know, this is going to uh, be able to uh, place our other energy needs, which I don't think is the case. Well, we saw with the deep freeze in Texas, your alternative energy f- sources didn't do all that well in the deep freeze, the windmills freezing up and so on. And, and uh, But apparently the regular natural gas plants also froze up. They they weren't insulated because they don't usually get cold spells there. So bad weather is bad weather. It can happen anytime, anywhere. Absolutely, yeah. And then you know, we get into the whole discussion, which we've had before, you know, the, the green movement, how it's, you know, so supportive of the windmills and, and of solar, but seemingly so against crude oil, yet uh, crude oil's been going up ever since they've been opening their mouth about how they hate crude oil and uh, has pulled back the last day or so, but really fooled the bears uh, there, for sure. Well, oil was trading around $70 a barrel. Do you think it's going to hit 100 this year? Good chance it could. I mean, I, I sort of speculated months ago that it could hit that kind of number when it was way down there just because the sentiment was so, so negative. And then, you know, a year ago, March, we had that negative washout where uh, crude oil was trading on, or was it minus $30 a barrel or some crazy number? And uh, that's usually a sign of a generational low. And one of the things that I do is I like to add the magic number 100 to when I see big breaks in um, individual stocks or commodities or some multiple of 10, just a mathematical thing we play with technically. And then when it got down to that number, I see, well, $100 from here would probably get us back up to 100 at some point. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised over time. It goes even a lot higher than that. It just got everybody so conditioned to believe that crude oil is going to go to zero and that we don't need it anymore. And, uh, you know, with the recovery, the world economies are now starting to experience um, you know, and the need even for the crude oil into the, um, the green energy movement. You still need the crude oil to pr- produce the kind of equipment and parts for solar or for even, you know, for uh, wind or, uh, you know, if you're a supporter of uranium, that's been hot too. Uranium's been moving up as well. You still need crude oil to, to build those plants, to build those equip- that equipment. So, uh, yep, it could be 100, Jim. Now, with uh, so many RV dealers across North America saying they're sold out or back ordered, I know how much it takes to gas up a motor home uh, on wheels. And somebody said you have, have to remember too, it's a house that's going to be facing hurricane force winds continually. So there's a lot of maintenance that goes along with it. But, uh, 200 to 500 dollars to fill one tank of a four tank vehicle. Is that really going to put a demand on gasoline over the summer? Absolutely, absolutely. And a lot of people are traveling and so forth. It's funny you mentioned RV. I've been sort of toying with an idea for years to get one of these things. And, uh, I think I'm going to wait until, uh, Tesla comes out with, uh, or equivalent comp- uh, type products put out by another company where it runs on electric so I don't have to deal with the gas. Issue. I definitely you definitely want solar panels on the top of your RV. That's for sure. But if there's some way of you know, avoiding the high cost of gasoline, which if my prediction that we're talking about of hundred dollars or more occurs, I mean it's going to be astronomical to fill up that tank. And uh, you know if you could plug it in somewhere and char- charge it, depending of course on the distance you can get. That's another big variable. Uh, that would be a big you know big saving. So uh, I've been sort of holding back on the RV project because of the potential cost as, as, as you've as you've indicated president the, trump told fox business he says bitcoin seems like a scam what's your opinion on that i uh, you know i don't i i can't go really go along with that it's a scam i mean look how much money has been made on this coin i mean you could have bought it for what 10 bucks you know, six, seven years ago, and it only went to $60,000. And companies have accepted it as, as a, a a legitimate exchange vehicle. I, I can't remember the exact country came out. El Salvador. Of, yeah, El Salvador. So you're good. You got all that research in front of you. They're accepting the Bitcoin as a, an acceptable medium of exchange. 
for a while uh, Elon Musk was accepting it uh, at uh, Tesla. Um, I'm not ready to give up on Bitcoin. I, uh, I mean, I, I like some of the others better, and we do cover this in our blockchain uh, letter, which I encourage listeners to consider subscribing to. But um, the recent history in Bitcoin has been the been shakes you out. It's probably a buy, and uh, there are predictions uh, that it could be a hundred thousand dollars a coin. You know, when it was trading at a fraction of this current price, and it got to sixty, and now we've had a nice correction from. You know, sixty thousand under thirty thousand, and uh, it could be setting up for another up leg. So um, I'm, I don't think it's a scam. Uh, you got, you know, you got to trade it like anything else, or if you're going to invest in it, you got to just put X dollars that you can afford to lose. I guess if you feel there's that much risk in it, but I think it's becoming more acceptable. I think there are better cryptos out there. I think if you're looking for future in cryptos, there are others, and without mentioning the names, we put those in our in our letter, but some, you know, big name, uh, uh, players have been out there touting some of the other names out there, and they may be, you know, a little more, actually more affordable, but they, they, they may be just better vehicles because of the technology behind them. They might be a little better in terms of a more reliable vehicle of exchange or, but, you know, than, than, than the Bitcoin is, because Bitcoin does have, does have problems, one of which is the amount of energy it takes to mine a Bitcoin. Um, I think I've mentioned this before. I read somewhere that the entire energy cost of the uh, country of Argentina is needed to be mining bitcoins. I mean, uh, big operations in China uh, have been underway using tremendous banks of energy and computers to mine for bitcoin. Well, you know, that's sort of ridiculous. And there are other vehicles that have been created that don't require that type of energy and effort. So I think uh, over time it may fade out. It may not be the best choice. But if you're a trader and you think there's a chance it could run again, you got to look at the charts and trade accordingly. And we just had a nice shake in it, so it might be setting up possibly for another leg higher. So let's keep an eye on it. The FBI says it's recovered most of the money paid out in the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline. However, they say they only got they got two million dollars less because Bitcoin had fallen so much since the scam took place. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, this is the risk, you know, when companies start accepting a coin that has this type of volatility. I mean, it's not, you know, I don't want to say, I guess you're going to compare it to the dollar, you know, the Canadian dollar or the U.S. dollar, you know, they're a lot more stable. They don't, they don't move, you know, 50% in value, uh, away from where they had been, you know, the way Bitcoin just did. So, you know, there are, there is risk in uh, accepting that as a medium of exchange. No question about it. That's uh, part and parcel to the game if you're using the cryptos, but the reasons why these were created, they were a way to avoid, you know, uh, to protect oneself supposedly against the valuation of currencies and for privacy reasons. And, uh, you know, it, and it, it became, and then also the uh, state of the internet and the technology and the creation of blockchain, you know, created these things because of their ability to perform financial functions faster, safer, more securely than, you know, the normal processes. So, uh, Yep, to answer your question there, there's definitely a risk there, but uh, there's no reason to avoid them. You just have to be smart about how you use them. I've seen discussions on business television about a possible or perhaps a real copper shortage with this big push for electric vehicles. The average electric car, I believe, uh, uses something like 300 pounds of copper. Yeah, not to mention the energy it takes to mine the copper, too, gets, gets, gets back to our crude oil uh, discussion a moment ago. Uh, that Yes, and what about, uh, you know, palladium and, uh, and platinum and, uh, and lithium and, you know, all the other ingredients uh, that go into the electric vehicle as well. So, uh, yep, a lot of demand on uh, commodities and on base metals and on metals in particular to produce the kind of things that, the green energy movement wants us to create. And if the next 20 years, uh, some companies are saying they're going to be 100% EV vehicles, that's going to be a lot of copper, a lot of lithium, a lot of palladium, platinum, and so forth. And uh, these are definitely markets that, uh, you know, would stand to benefit. So I agree with you, higher prices. But, like, you know, we've seen this. We just saw it in the solar stocks. We talked about this a few moments ago. You get a big run. that could be a 50% correction. We just saw it in... Uh, Bitcoin, almost a 50% correction. You can see it in, in uh, copper, too, and then back up again. So you have to be aware of where you are 
on the charts if you're trading them. If you're just taking a long-term viewpoint that copper is going to be great, then sure, own copper stocks long-term like Freeport and Southern Copper and others, but be aware that, you know, you you got to be aware of the risk and uh, some portfolios prefer to write call options against their positions to generate a little protection, a little cash flow against their holdings just in case uh, there are setbacks along the way which are inevitable. Now, also with batteries means uh, lead zinc is going to be used, and most of the world's major lead zinc mines have either closed or are in the process of closing. What's that going to do to those boring mineral prices when you talk about lead and zinc? What could be more boring? But if the prices start to skyrocket, they become interesting again. Right. I I don't have a particular name in the uh, lead zinc area. I'd have to do some research. But, uh, listen, there was a time... When gold was down at about near a thousand dollars an ounce and mines were closing and you couldn't raise any money for gold and silver operations here just, you know, a couple, three years ago. I mean, it was, uh, things changed really quick. So money's going to find its way to get those uh, operations back in gear if there's demand for those, uh, those, those materials. So I would say, uh, if you're correct in your statement about the demand for those, we got to find the stocks and companies that are going to benefit from, um, you know, re-engineering and you know, reigniting those operations. The six major Canadian banks say they are a wash in cash. People are paying off their credit cards. They're loading up their savings accounts with all of this government aid. What's going to happen with this money? Will banks be doing their very best to shovel that money out the door? And will that affect interest rates? Uh, I don't know if I can handle all those questions. I'll do my best. I know bank stocks are starting to back off here a little bit because of the spread. The spread, they're making a little less money on the, on the spread. Um, uh, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for the banks, uh, Jim. You know, I'm sure they're going to survive. Uh, you know, they're part and parcel to a lot of shenanigans over the years. Um, one most notable of which was Wells Fargo with all that criminal activity they were involved with. But, uh, um, you know, the bottom line is rates are probably going up, and uh, as rates go up, banks tend to make more money. So uh, even though we're having a little pop here in the interest rates where they ran up, now they're pulling back a little bit. I guess traders and investors became less concerned that the Fed's going to do something right away, and uh, they got a little more bullish, thinking that, you know, you can buy bonds and you know, it's not going to call, you know, there's going to be more of an opportunity here on the long side, but uh, I think the overall bigger picture trend is that uh, we're going to see higher rates. So the banks uh, will, will do well in that environment, and I'm sure it's going to resume. You know, whether it's three, three days or six months, I think you're going to see rates starting to move back up again. So anyway, I don't know if I covered your question there. How damaging have low interest rates been to the insurance companies and to pension funds? It's been disaster because they're not unable to generate the yield that they promised uh, of their pension inv- investors. And uh, there's been talk for the longest time that rates had to go up to, sa- to save these funds because they have to generate X percent a year. And with uh, zero interest rates in Europe and near zero here in the U.S., how were they able uh, to do that? And uh, it's it's still an unanswered question, and there's still risk to these, uh, these pension funds that... Uh, you know, cannot meet their demand. The question is whether there's going to be bailouts of them, whether there's going to be collapses. There's a lot of talk about this over the months and years, and I really don't know where that's all going to resolve. But, uh, you know, they haven't been able to, you know, conservatively generate. I'm, I'm, I'm just talking out loud here. Of course, we had an extremely strong stock market, and I'm assuming some of their, you know, investments have been in the market. So perhaps that offset the fact that rates are so low, they're making it on the equity side, and they're able to uh, still satisfy their pensioner investors. So, uh, but for the longest time, when the markets weren't doing well with rate flow, it's difficult for them to, you know, to generate the returns because they generally like to be in the bond market. Many, many of them use the strategy of selling call options, for example, to generate cash flow, uh, which is a little bit of an offset. But uh, low rates isn't good for the. Um, for the pension funds and that has been a big problem for uh, for the longest time pensioners as well uh as people get near retirement they like to save some money and have cash and having some interest on that cash would be nice because you don't want to risk 
your money in something else, and, and yet you're being told you have to risk it because you won't make any income. Are, are retiring or retired people in a, a really uh, squeezing spot between a rock and a hard place? Yeah, they have been for the longest time. This is an ongoing story now for, for a few years. I mean, ever since we've had the zero interest rates. But, you know, the rationale is go buy dividend paying stocks. Many are still yielding, you know, in the 2 to 5% range, depending on what stock you're buying. And if it's a blue chip company, and if you're happy to get your dividend, and you think the company, if particularly ones that have, you know, multi-decade uh, track records for paying dividends, and you're willing to accept the volatility of the stock market as long as you get your uh, check on your income uh that's not a bad strategy and uh and you know in fact if you buy some high dividend paying stocks sell some call options against it above the market generating a little like, additional cash flow is good and if you're in a big name and let's just throw out a name you know like uh uh you know johnson and johnson or coca-cola or kellogg or one of the companies that will probably be around forever that have had multi-decade uh, track records of paying dividends. So you're getting only 2 or 3%. Well, that's better than zero. And like I say, if you generate a little uh, call option writing against the uh, positions, you can do that quarterly. You know, you might generate an extra few percentage points return on your money. And if, you know, a stock like that drops 20 or 30%, but, you know, they all tend to come back on a, after a correction. But if you're taking a long-term viewpoint and you just want the income, that's one way to... Uh, you know, offset the fact that you can't get it in CDs or bonds and so forth as we used to. Some corporate bonds can give you that type of risk, and some convertible bonds are also an, uh, an opportunity. But to answer your question, yes, a lot of money has moved into the market. They were sort of forced into it because there was no other way to generate any return. As it turned out, it worked out great because the stock market continued to go up. Of course, we had our big shake last March where, you know, dropped 30 with 38% in 10 days, but it ended up coming back. So um, that's the history of these big corrections. So the last year's was probably historic in terms of how fast it came back um, over the last 100 years. And if you really take the bigger viewpoint, you know, they do all tend to come back. The problem is if you're 80 years old you know, or 90 years old, you don't have a lot of time to wait for it to come back. So there's definitely a trade-off there, and you've got to talk to a good advisor to, you know, balance your investments to make sure that you don't get yourself in a situation where if you need the money, and one of these corrections unfolds that you can't get to, you can't get to it. So I guess you got to be diversified, as we always say. You have to be. Employers are complaining of a labor shortage. Uh, some say people are addicted now to their government aid checks, and they just don't want to go back to their low-paying jobs. But you'll recover AC. That's uh, I, I'm going BC AC as before COVID, after COVID. Well, before COVID, there was a labor shortage and people were scrambling to find skilled workers. Is it going to be even worse this time around? Because the survey said 60% of people who had to spend time at home because of this uh, pandemic, they were reassessing their career opportunities. They haven't trained for anything new. I know that's that, that's been a big, big problem. And getting that the free money is also a big problem. And then I hear just here in the New York area that I'm, I've been in for the last uh, few weeks, uh, uh, went into a few businesses, and I hear managers complain that they can't hire anybody because they don't want to work because uh, they're getting so much money free. Of course, that's all going to change at some point. The government can't keep giving more people money. Uh, you know, it's going to be some pushback to this, and it may be sooner rather than later. So uh, the job picture, you know, should improve, but that's that's for the ten, fifteen dollar an hour type. Uh, uh, employee, but if you do need those skills, you're definitely going to have to get retrained. And um, you know, I was I always sort of joked myself. I said, you know, what if the stock market went to hell? What would I do? You know, I mean, I would have to go maybe apply for a job at the post office or train to do something like that. And I've I've been saying this to myself for about over 40 40 years. But it turns out the stock market really never goes to hell. There's always opportunities, both long and short, and uh, it always seems to come back even after. A big shakeout. So I didn't have to change my career, though I joked to myself about it for the longest time, that can I really do this forever and will the market always be here? As it turns out, the market is always here, <laughs> and it has to be for a lot of reasons. So it depends which market you're trading. But uh, 
I'm not encouraging our listeners that they should give up career objectives for the market, but I'm just saying that, uh, you know, things sort of work out the way they're supposed to work out. And uh, uh, to answer your question, I always encourage my kids to, to train and to be prepared for, you know, changes that, uh, you know, will occur and the, for demands on their skills. A uh, regular contributor to the show, Mike Swanson, uh, pointed out when the pandemic started and all the casinos closed, those uh, habitual gamblers looked for new opportunities and they found the stock market was the perfect place. They didn't mind risking money and they were finding that they were getting great opportunities and perhaps a better betting book on uh, companies and so on, like we're seeing with Reddit and uh, GameStop and so on. Those are pure gambles. But they're intelligent gambles, too. Uh, depends what kind of money you're using and whether you do it as I do it, um, you know, technically. Um, you know, we, for example, you know, I don't want to take, you know, credit for a lot of trades because, you know, obviously we have a couple losing trades here and there. We're not, no one's 100%, but, you know, we, uh, we were long GME just the last couple of days. Um, I don't know, I think we made 30 or $40 in it. I have to check the exact number. We sold it over 300 he dropped about 80 points today, got down to about 211, 212, and I feel really good that we sold yesterday over 300. Uh, this is um, it's on our track record, and our clients who are listening know this was the case. So, uh, you know, this was based on, you know, technical analysis. It wasn't based on that I'm, uh, I have some type of great intuition or, you know, I got a crystal ball in front of me. You know, you look at the charts, you see how much these things run up. You can see corrective levels in it, and that's why I've been a survivor at VR Trader for all these decades because, you know, for the most part, we're right more than we're wrong, and you try to be objective looking at the technical uh, technical charts. So getting back to what you're saying, you know, even the amateurs out there, you know, to pick up some basic technical analysis skills is not that difficult. You can take any kind of basic course on the Internet. This is not rocket science. So you can look at moving averages. You can look at the patterns that are repeatable on the charts, which uh, go back decades and decades, or all these books you can read, you can see the same technical patterns, you know, whether they're head and shoulder formations or rectangles on the chart or uh, pennants or trend lines or, you know, all these uh, where the moving averages are or where the moving averages cross. It's, it's only about 10 or 12 key things you need, really need to learn looking at a chart. And uh, the so-called amateurs out there, many of them are very bright young people, who have picked up on this, uh, and I think I believe many of them are using it. I mean, some may just be, you know, out there just buying something because someone else is touting it, but I think the guys that have made the big, big money have used, you know, both technical analysis and some fundamental insight to uh, do well, and I encourage any of those who want to play, as you call, the most specul- more speculative names, but, you know, in my viewpoint is all stocks are speculative, if you don't uh, look at the charts and decide where is a good entry and where is a good exit point. And some of the calls that we've made, you know, are based on what the charts are telling us. I mean, do these things look oversold? Is their volume coming into the upside? Have they run too much? Is volume coming into the downside? Now it's time to get out of them. Uh, is, uh, is there a lot of good news right at the top, which tends to be the case? Or is there a lot of bad news right at the bottom, which tends to be the case? And you put all these pieces together, and you can generally, over time, do do pretty well. So those who are at home who are looking to uh, trade, uh, whether it's using my service or others, or doing a little homework on technical analysis, I would definitely say this is a career opportunity that lasts a lifetime. And as long as the markets are open, and I see no reason why they wouldn't, unless the internet shuts down or, or we run into some type of other catastrophic event, but. Uh, For the most part, it's something I would encourage and uh, very supportive of. Well, Mark, uh, all of this uh, goes to the very name of your newsletter, VRTrader.com. Can you just give us a little bit of background to it and and why it's called that? Yeah, sure. Well, it started years ago when I was a floor trader, but to make a long story short, uh, most of what I do is based on volume analysis and the the term that we use is volume reversal, which is the, what the VR stands for. And, you know, though we use a lot of other technical terms and, and, and indicators and we use a lot of cyclical analysis, a lot of what I do is based on these volume shifts that I see uh, in stocks. And some of the big names that I mentioned, there were a couple in this interview, you know, were triggered by these volume shifts coming off bottoms and tops in the stock. So uh, VR, VR traders based on that basic concept that a good part of what I look at is based on volume trends and uh, analysis. And as I say, nothing is 100%, but uh, 
is the old expression, volume precedes price. And that seems to work for us, that you see a volume shift before a price shift or simultaneous with it. And if you can identify it, uh, usually can make some money. Mark, do you have a special offer for our This Week in Money listeners? We sure do. It's at vrtrader.com, and we, again, are offering 50% off. And the code, if you go to the newsletter and you pick up any of the newsletters, there's several on the screen, but when you get to the promo code section of the order form, if you enter 2021 half off, Two zero two one, H A L F O F F. You get fifty percent off of any of the uh, individual letters for any time frame you sign up for. So, take advantage of it if you uh, want to take advantage of VR Trader. Mark, thank you so much for being on this week in money. My pleasure, Jim. Thanks again for having me. My guest has been Mark Leibovit, editor and publisher of the Leibovit VR Newsletters, also known as VRTrader.com. Our conversation took place on June 10th. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Bob Hoy, and Mark Leibovit. And thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update. From American Manganese President Larry Ray, I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to Company Showcase, Larry. Thanks, Jim. Larry, can you tell us about the two news releases your company put out this week? Well, the uh, first uh, release was about the uh, White House's 100-day battery supply chain review. And uh, we were mentioned in that, uh, page 108. Uh, we'll have attachment to this podcast. And uh, so you can hear it. Actually, our YouTube video was on there. And uh, that's, a, that's a big kudo for us. So uh, that makes us very happy. But they're looking at uh, things, especially in the uh, recycling area, that's of interest to us. And uh, that looks like it could be a catalyst for uh, getting recycling uh, started and going in the U.S. They're already talking about building uh, bigger battery manufacturing facilities and uh, everything else in the U.S. And uh, so it's uh, it's an opportune time. Now, the second release is... Uh, was the about the AGM, and I've only got a couple things to say about that. We got in with uh, over 95% of the votes, and uh, so uh, that was a good thing. And the uh, uh, big question on it, uh, which came up this year and never came up before because it's been in every uh, AGM brochure, is the uh, increase to uh, 20% of the outstanding uh, uh potential to uh, set options and uh, so at this time they talked about that and let's just let's just give a, a little bit of discussion on that the 20 percent like I say has been there for many AGMs uh, suddenly became a focal point uh, on the bull boards uh, for this AGM but I just want to say that that's not filling the insiders pockets that's uh, that sets aside a, a a very large amount of shares for uh, we especially you know we have the potential of uh, actually building up within the next year our infrastructure here in the office and uh, we have to attract the top notch guys and they they look for top notch uh, options so uh, we want to have those available for new guys coming on, we want to have incentives for the existing staff who's worked their ass off for uh, you know, since uh, August of 2016 when we first broke out uh, and into new territory, and uh, and away we go there. 
There was one other thing that uh, keeps popping up, and some guys would like to email me that we put out nothing but fluff. <laughs> we put out something, and uh, it costs us millions of dollars to get there. It's not fluff. It's uh, progress on the reports. Most of the 99% of the people that listen to the podcast like that. And, uh, you know, because we talk about... Uh, what happened uh, as we are in the press release right now. And I think where they're talking about fluff is we're not doing deals like most of these black mass producers uh, willy nilly all over the place. And because uh, we got to get, we got to nail down our costs. There's all kinds of ramifications when it comes to uh, cutting a deal. And uh, cutting the deal means that you have to have all the results and you have to know exactly what your uh, capex is going to be, what your opex is going to be. And um, we see lots of advantages in uh, this last part we're doing, which is a morphology, and uh, that will reflect uh, on the price that we get for our product at the end of the day. And that can be a substantial increase. So we want to know what that's going to be uh, before we sit down with a uh, pen and pencil and ink any kind of deal. If we ink a deal, um, we, we want to know where we sit in the uh, puzzle, we don't want to come out on the uh, short end or uh, at a, on an end that we'll, the deal won't last on because we take all the advantages. We want it to be a win-win deal. And, uh, you know, we do already have an MOU, but we haven't set down the standards on that yet, but that is coming. And, uh, you know, the uh, to have a... 20 deals in my pocket, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, the company's not in a position to build 20 different uh, processing plants, and um, so the timing's got to be perfect. Uh, we uh, wait for the, the biggest and the best, and I'm sure that's coming because we've had uh, NDAs with them. Uh, they seem to be uh, uh, very uh, as accepted to our process. They're uh, they're not pushing back as much as they used to, or they're not pushing back at all. They're uh, in agreement. Uh, remember that everything we do is third party validated, and uh, we report the like progress reports every time we have something to report on, and uh, that's usually uh, 30, 40 times a year. So uh, that uh, that is one of the things that uh, comes out of the. Uh, uh, out of the AGM that we put out a lot of fluff. Uh, I, I don't know what the hell, where the hell they get that from. It's cost us uh, ten or eleven million dollars to put out all that fluff, and uh, you know it costs us nothing to do an MOU. So uh, you know it's not like uh, we're uh, building pies in the sky. We uh, we're very proud of our uh, process, which is solid. And uh, we're very proud of the of Cometco for bringing it to this point. Now, you may ask, why why didn't uh, we go another route? Well, I'm, I'm afraid that Cometco is the only one that had the answers. And uh, you know, we were lucky to tie them up uh, initially in 2008-9, and now uh, they're working hard on our uh, process and uh, also on the uh, manganese project for the uh, DLA. So that that is the interesting things that happen. The uh, I think I already mentioned that we got about ninety five percent of the vote to put the directors back in their seats and uh, to approve everything that uh, that uh, was put on the table. And uh, you know, people had a chance to uh, you know vote or to go yay or nay and uh, on their vote, and that uh, that. That time has come and gone. We're back in the seat for another year, much to the chagrin of the predators. But uh, the because uh, there was a lot of uh, hate mail going on that uh, was happening, uh, you know, up to the AGM and after the AGM. And uh, that uh, most of the time I just ignore it, and uh, because uh, you know I know who I know who my shareholders are. And I know who's loyal and who's not loyal. So uh, that's a that's a big plus. If you're a CEO and you don't know that, you're subject to all kinds of ramifications. But anyway, 
that's the uh, nuts and shells of it. We will have a few attachments on our uh, our uh, podcast this this week or today. Uh, what we're doing right now, I should say, but it'll go out in uh, two or three hours. And uh, once that's out, then uh, everybody can uh, look at it over the weekend. I would advise that you look at the uh, the uh, White House paper there, that uh, and especially go to 107, 108, 109 in that area. Uh, page, and uh, you'll see that uh, we're prominent out there. And, uh, yeah, you know, that's another big feather in our cap. So uh, I think that uh, pretty much covers what I wanted to talk about. The uh, We've, uh, you know, we're still making achievements next week. We hope to have some new results and... Uh, and uh, maybe even something about what's happening up on the uh, Copper Gold show in central BC, and uh, we can uh, make an announcement on that. And, uh, you know, we're making great progress with uh, Native relations up there. Uh, we've, all the applications are in, and uh, we expect to uh, actually uh, see some uh, results coming out of that very soon. We've had a good, uh, we have actually had very good relationships with the natives. This is not my first rodeo with them up in that area. We've, uh, we've been uh, working off and on there for, oh God, what, 14 years. And, uh, so, uh, yeah, everything as far as I can see is looking really good. And, uh, the one thing that I wanted to talk about is, uh, one thing I've watched, which is, uh, uh, you can call it an anomaly or whatever. But when the EV cars first came out, the, uh, there was uh, Tesla and then there was the wannabes. And uh, now uh, at that particular time, uh, some of those shares were trading in the dollar range, dollars range, uh, maybe three, four dollars or whatever, and uh, went on to be hundreds of dollars. And uh, so uh, then it worked its way down to the battery manufacturers and uh, you know, companies that uh, were trading again in a few dollars went on to be hundreds of dollars. And I can see the same thing happening for recycling. I think that the uh, recycling is going to uh, take front and center because that's a new kid on the block, and uh, it's uh, it's happening as we speak. Uh, you know, we can tell by the uh, responses we get in our NDA calls and uh, from the... Uh, approaches we're getting to finances it's uh you know there's a lot out there and uh so uh you know it's like everything turned on a dime here about a month ago so uh i just think that we could get things to look forward to um and uh i wish everybody a great weekend and uh, i'm looking forward to resting up and uh getting ready for next week Larry, for people new to American Manganese, what's the company all about? Well, the company is a critical metals company that uh, is involved in several areas of the criticality of metals, uh, the major ones being in the recycling of batteries and manganese, which is, uh, has always been my the critical metal that I think is most critical to the United States because we don't have any production, neither does Canada. And, uh, you know, so the... Uh, uh, production of uh, manganese, uh, which is used in uh, all kinds of, uh, uh, including batteries, uh, applications. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's critical. I mean, you uh, 90% of it's used in the making of steel. If you don't have manganese, uh, you can't make steel. And if you can't make steel, the world stops. So uh, I think that's very critical. I know that they're talking about importing uh, manganese and everything like that, but that's uh, that's something that uh, they will have to do anyway. But, uh, you know, certainly we can supply some of that end of it. Larry, where can people get more information about the company and where are you traded? You can get all the information you want. I know that some people... I uh, feel it's buried, but they have to remember that a lot of these uh, PowerPoints and everything that uh, Zarco does is, has been on YouTube and it's been all over. It's been viewed by hundreds of thousands. And uh, so, you know, that's a big plus. So uh, the uh, 
They can, but they can find anything that they need on the uh, site. They just have to visit the site. If you got nothing to do, go to the site. Go to the uh, news release section. Uh, go to the uh, PowerPoint section. Go to any section you want, and it'll tell you everything that we're doing. And uh, you can reach us at seven seven eight five seven four 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 four. You can email me at l r e a u g h at a m y m n dot com. And uh, we'll go from there. Larry, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on June 11th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.